<laughs> in any relationship, there are certain behaviors that allow that relationship to mature, growing more intimate and more secure as time goes on. These, uh, there, there are behaviors that, that just connect us, and when we're connected, we survive. When we're connected, we actually thrive. Now, last time we learned that love connects us in the body of Christ. Love connects us to each other. Love is respecting the other person and seeking to meet their need as an opportunity happens to arise, usually at the cost of a personal sacrifice. And we learn that Jesus modeled that kind of love that we are to love one another with. So love is the basis for all the other things that connect us and bind us together in Christ. Love keeps us together. We are going to explore yet another behavior that keeps us together. The behavior that strengthens the unity of our relationship together is long-suffering. Long-suffering is the empowerment of the Holy Spirit that keeps us together. Now in the body we never want to be a recipient of long suffering, but we certainly are expected by the Lord to extend that to others. Now long suffering, it's an older word. We don't use it very often in conversations today. And if you've ever read the King James Version of the Bible, you've come across the word long suffering. In fact, in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 in the King James Version, the scripture reads, the Lord is not slack concerning some of His promises as some some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now, modern translations and the paraphrases take that word long suffering and render it patience, but I think that the word patience, at least the way we commonly use it today, doesn't really convey to us the depth of what is trying to be communicated. Because long suffering deals with how you handle problems with people. Long-suffering really overrides the desire to smack someone in the side of the head from whom our enlightened perspective desperately needs it. Do you know anybody like that? It's our ability to hold our temper coupled with the ability to continue to keep on loving them. You know, there are people in the church, members of the body, brothers and sisters of Christ, who just don't seem to get it. And long-suffering helps us to continue to nurture them until they come to a time in their lives where they do get it, whatever it may be. You see this model by Jesus. So long-suffering keeps trying with people who don't get it. And in Matthew chapter 23, verse um, 37, Jesus is standing, uh, looking down on Jerusalem, and He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, murderer of the prophets, killer of the ones who brought you God's news. How often I ache to embrace your children, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you wouldn't let me. Now, Jerusalem, it refers to the place where um, the chosen of God live, and Jerusalem's children then refers to the Jews, those who should have recognized and accepted Jesus as the Messiah, but instead rejected Him. How often I ache to embrace. That's the action of long-suffering. There's a compassion for those who don't get it. Jesus demonstrated long-suffering as He was dying on the cross for those who don't get it. Luke chapter 23, verse 24, Lord prays, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. So in both those instances, the prayer for Jerusalem and then the prayer of dying on the cross, both instances, Jesus wants the best for people, but the people refuse. But even in His long-suffering, Jesus still wants them to be able to get it. Now, sometimes long-suffering gets direct. It definitely confronts. It seeks to correct. Long-suffering is not passive. Many people think it's just let things slide, but it's not. In Luke chapter 22, verses 36 through 38, Jesus is teaching again, and He says, Get ready for trouble. Look to what you'll need. There are difficult times ahead. Pawn your coat and get a sword. That was written in the Scripture. He was lumped in with the criminals, gets its final meaning in me. Everything written about me is now coming to conclusion. And they said, look, Master, we have two swords. But he said, enough of that. No more sword talk. Here the disciples, they just missed the point of what Jesus is trying to tell them and immediately take the literal meaning upon your coat and buy a sword. They don't get it. Rather emphatically, Jesus tells them, enough 
enough. See, long-suffering corrects. It just doesn't let things slide. And long-suffering doesn't retaliate against people who don't get it. Again, in Luke chapter 9, verse 35, then the Samaritans learned that Jesus' was, destination was Jerusalem, and so they refused hospitality. And when the disciples James and John learned of it, they said, Master, do you want us to call a bolt of lightning down from the sky and incinerate them? And Jesus turned to them and said, of course not. Now, culturally, it was a huge insult to refuse hospitality. And two of Jesus' inner circle, those who are considered some of the closest, they want to retaliate. They want to get some revenge. They've been following Jesus almost three years at this point, and they don't get it. They don't get it. See, long-suffering doesn't retaliate, and long-suffering makes it possible for us in such a circumstance to use that circumstance to teach what is right. Jesus said, no, we're not raining fire down on them because of their rudeness. <laughs> Boy, there are times that I have wanted to lay the smack down on somebody for not getting it. I mean, how long do you wait until you, till you get this down in your life? How long till you see that you're just killing yourself? that you're not listening to the wisdom of other people. What is going on with you? You just don't get it. And I want to give him a piece of my mind. But lately I've been learning there's not a, very much of it left, so I had better keep it all to myself. But long-suffering helps me not to be offensive with people who don't get it. Long-suffering allows you to take disappointment in others' behavior and stride. John 6, um, 63 through 67. Again, Jesus is teaching and he says, The Spirit can make life. Sheer muscle and willpower don't make anything happen. Every word I've spoken to you is a spirit word. And so it is life-making. But some of you are resisting. You're refusing to have any part of it. Scripture goes on and says Jesus knew that some uh, Jesus knew from the start that some weren't going to risk themselves for him and he knew who would betray him. And so he went on to say, this is why I told you earlier that no one is capable of coming to me on his own. You get to me only as a gift from the Father. And after this speech, there was a lot of disciples, disciples who left. <coughs> They no, wanted, no longer wanted to be associated with him. And then Jesus turns to the twelve, and he looks at them, and he says, Do you also want to leave? You see, people have a great ability to disappoint. And, what, and it, it happens all the time in the church. And my friends, it shouldn't be so. It should never happen in the church. But it does. It does. And it's the grace of long-suffering that hopes, that hopes in the other. If today, then maybe tomorrow, they'll get it. Long-suffering allows you to deal with the exasperation at another's behavior. Again, Jesus modeling for us in John 14, 18. The close disciple, Philip, says, Master, show us the Father and we'll be content. And Jesus says, Philip, you've been with me all this time. You still don't get it. You still don't understand. To see me is to see the Father. So how can you ask, where is the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Philip, you still don't get it. Okay, let's, let's, try, it. let's try again. That, my friends, is long-suffering. It really is. People. <laughs> The pastor said this, ministry would be great if it wasn't for people. I think I might have said that once or twice, jokingly saying that. Friends, look around the room. See all the folks here? Most of the folks here are your brothers and sisters in Christ. Some are on the very verge of becoming a member of the family of God. Others are here today just, just to kick the tires and check things out. But take a look around. Do you realize the only person in the room that's normal is you? That's it. Everyone else is a shade off. There's some degree of weird. They are. Long-suffering is what keeps you going in such a group. Sometimes in the family of God, people want to fight you. They're always opposed to the things that you happen to be for. And then there are folks who are constantly clamoring for your attention. They consume, they consume your time, the talent, the treasure, if you allow it. Some people will talk your ear off. 
Some seem to have the spiritual gift of complaining. Or they happen to have a schedule that prevents them from ever helping out. Some always have something for you to do. And it seems like you're always helping them. They perpetually seem like they just don't get it. The writer of Hebrews looked out at the congregation of folks that he had in the fellowship, and he said this in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. By this time, he says, you ought to be teachers yourselves. Yet here I find you need someone to sit down with you and go over all the basics of God again. Starting from square one, we're talking baby milk here, when you should have been on solid food long ago. Milk is for beginners, inexperienced in God's ways. Solid food is for the mature who have some practice and telling right from wrong. Boy, in the best of fellowships, those local congregations of the body, there are people who will drive you nuts. It's a given. It is a given. There will always be an EGR, a person who requires extra grace to work with. Do you have an extra grace required person in mind? Do you know someone who fits that bill? It's just kind of exasperating, who just can drive you nuts, who you want to say one more time, and I am going to smack them in the side of the head. Ever been there with anybody? Certainly not. Not you guys. You got this down. Extra grace required, EGR. Grace is the desire to be and the power to do. And when dealing with those brothers and sisters that just don't get it, that extra grace comes in the form of long-suffering. So long-suffering, it keeps you in the game with people who don't get it. The Holy Spirit's empowerment makes it possible for you to lay down your life for those who don't get it. Long-suffering doesn't turn you into a doormat, though. It doesn't. It doesn't turn you into a person who's easily taken advantage. No, instead, you have the power to lovingly correct inordinate behavior. When people really tick you off, you find that you don't retaliate. You realize for now they just don't get it. So you can handle the disappointment and the feelings of exasperation when they don't meet expectations. You continue to love them in hopes that one day soon, please soon, they'll get it. And, and if you happen to be wondering what folks need to get when they don't get it, I've already given you one answer. See, everybody in the body is expected to love. And way too often people don't get it that being a lover is what they're supposed to do. That's how they're supposed to be. Obviously, relationships work best when both parties are committed to loving each other. And if you've got that love thing down for one another, you've got it. You got it. If there's no judgment in your heart, no condemnation for others, you've got it. If you're encouraging one another, admonishing one another, building one another up, hey, you've got it. And there's teaching one another. There's listening to one another. There's counseling one another. There's caring another's burden. There's weeping with those in grief. There's rejoicing with those in a celebration. These types of behaviors demonstrate that you've got it. Getting it is helping others in their journey of becoming more like Jesus. Getting it is being like the ambassador of the kingdom of God who you happen to be already empowered to be, an ambassador to the kingdom. Getting it is being salt and light in a world that needs Jesus. Basically, friends, getting it is about being like Jesus. A man named Carlo Corretto, he's passed away. He wasn't a theologian, a priest, or a pastor. He's just one of the folk. And yet he still had a keen insight into the things of God. And he wrote about the church. He wrote about us. <coughs> How baffling you are, O church, and yet how I love you. How you have made me suffer, and yet how much I owe you. I should like to see you destroyed, and yet I need your presence. You have given me so much scandal, and yet you have made me understand sanctity. I've never seen, I have seen nothing in the world more devoted to obscurity, more compromise, more faults, and I've touched nothing more pure and more generous and more beautiful. 
how often I wanted to shut the doors of my soul in your face, and how often I prayed to die in the safety of your arms. No, I, I cannot free myself from you because I am you, although not completely. You see, you and I are the church, and in Coretto here, I see his expression of long-suffering. We strive to get it as we continue to help those who don't get it. And that attitude, that behavior, that keeps us together, keeps the body healthy, keeps it vital and thriving. Now, I personally praise God for His long-suffering because I have discovered that I don't get it way too often. And if God gave up on me in those times that I didn't do His will, I would be headed to eternity without God. So I thank God that He doesn't treat me as my sins deserve. In Psalms 103, 8 through 11, boy, I have come to this scripture. God is sheer mercy and grace, not easily angered. He is rich in love. Love. He doesn't endlessly nag or scold nor hold grudges forever. He doesn't treat us as our sins deserve nor pay us back in full for our wrongs. As high as the heaven is over the earth, so strong is his love for those who fear him. So I thank God for His long-suffering when it comes to me. I thank my brothers and sisters in Christ who, by actualizing this power of the Holy Spirit, that when I fell short of expectations, they extended to me long-suffering by confronting me, by listening to me, by encouraging me, and just plain not giving up on me. Sometimes folks are hard nut to crack. They just don't get it. You know, I've tried and I've tried and I've tried and tried. What do I do? Try again. What? It seems like I'm not getting anywhere. Oh, you may be getting somewhere. You just don't realize it. I tell people, some people build this wall around them because of the hurt and the pain in their lives. And it's a tall wall. And what you're doing a lot of times is making paper airplanes and writing inside of it, I love you. And you just, you just fly that thing up over their wall and it falls. One of these times they're going to pick that paper airplane up, that thing that you did, and they're going to open it and they're going to see the message, I love you. And that just might motivate them to take one little brick out of the wall and look over and see who it is. And when they look, they'll see Jesus in you. And that'll change their lives. My friends, it is easy to avoid and disregard someone, to write them off when they don't get it. But to do so is to damage the body. So no, instead... Those folks that loved on me, who were long-suffering for me, they did the hard thing. They did what the Scripture says for each of us to do. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1 through 3, and I'm going to read it in the King James Version because the Old English uses that word, long-suffering. Scripture says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you were called, with all lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Long-suffering, forbearing, putting up with those who don't get it. So I thank God for my brothers and sisters that get it and don't treat me as my sins deserve. Long-suffering in the body should be freely and frequently dispensed. And God empowers you to give it away. And God empowers you not to need to receive it. Wouldn't it be nice not to need long-suffering? Do you get it? 